I showed you a typical Florida spoda sole and I described to you the advantage that we're going to have on these uh, smaller acreages that selected for, uh, for this polyculture orchard. You'll notice that there's hardly a section larger than six acres. Um, luckily, nothing's too much smaller than about three and a half. And the reason is that those are the places where I had soils that would drain themselves without any sort of intervention. Of course, with uh, having good drainage, um, we have the issue of maintaining soil moisture, which is, you know, of course, super important for just tree performance to start. But on a project like this, where we're going to be managing all of our fertility by way of uh, accumulating atmospheric carbon and atmospheric nitrogen in the form of biomass and recycling that nutrients back into creating a topsoil, you know, and cycling those nutrients by way of the microorganisms in the topsoil, moisture becomes hypercritical, not just for tree health, but also for the entire system to be possible. And so started looking at what are our options as far as ir irrigation. And uh, typical irrigation on trees here in Florida is done with uh, micro jets. And there's some very lovely micro jets that are available. Uh, Maxi Jet makes one, and they're used on tons and tons of trees here in Florida. And they have a pattern that's about 12 feet in diameter and typically you'll put one jet on each tree and you'll irrigate to uh, usually they irrigate to a fairly shallow target depth especially on these spodosols because they like to have shallow root systems because they're afraid of flooding events killing off the roots and usually they're running uh, fertigation systems and of course this irrigation doesn't lend itself at all to an organic system where the trees are going to require much larger root systems because we're not going to be supplementing nutri nutrition on these sands, you know, just spoon feeding these trees, spoon feeding these trees. It works great. You basically you grow, you grow these kind of uh, fruit machines that way. And you know, for a guy who's just trying to grow oranges, it's fantastic. But for, for a sustainable, a uh, long-term orchard system where we're going to try to draw benefit by way of the microbiology, that's not going to work. So the next thing to do was kind of start to look at orchards in California and look at how are they irrigating orchards where they have cover crops. Um, it became evident very early in the process that because most of our disease pressure is going to be fungal and bacterial here, we needed to have lots of air movement in this, in this orchard system. And on wide spacings, we're also going to have light penetration. So in order to be able to fix that carbon and nitrogen from the air that we need to build that topsoil that's going to feed the plants, um, knew that we needed to have ground covers that would have a legume component and a grass component. If we're going to be fixing all of our nutrition by way of uh, cover crops, then especially on sands like this that are excessively well drained, we're gonna need to be able to get moisture into the row middles. And to do that, those, those micro jets, which are the typical solution here in Florida, just aren't gonna work. So started looking at uh, California orchard systems and what particular emitters they were using. And there's a company called Nelson and they make a head called a rotator. And it's, it's, really, it's really, really good. Um, it's designed to be able to use, even in cases where you have very slow infiltration into the profile. So it puts out uh, not very much water at a time, but it does it over a large area. So kind of like those micro jets, except, you know, it'll throw, you can throw 25 feet with it. Really a neat device. Um, probably not exactly right for here. And so what we've settled on is a wobbler type sprinkler. They're used a little bit in tropical fruit orchards in South Florida. Um, and basically what those do, it's, it's made by a company named Senninger. And what those wobblers do is effectively simulate rain. 
And you can generate uh, coverage uniformities so good that they can be used in potted plant nurseries where you have potted plants set out in a grid and you have a couple of these overhead uh, wobbler sprinklers and every pot gets the same amount of water. So that's, that's what we need. What we need is to be able to simulate rainfall. And so that's how we're gonna manage uh, getting the water down and getting the water down evenly. And the way we're gonna manage controlling the amount of water and the interval at which we put it down is by understanding what our moisture holding capacity in the soils are. So we know that we're not gonna want to let our soils dry down to more than about 30% of the plant available water we don't want to deplete before we add water again. So we'll go from field capacity, which is the total amount that the field can hold, down to you know, 30% lower than that, and then you want to fill back up. And we're probably going to manage it on about a two foot depth. And so in Florida, like we talked about, let's say we let it get down to 50% of plant available water, which you're gonna have less optimal results in the trees if you do that, but it'll show you what, what is the largest irrigation we could need and at what frequency could we need it. If you depleted halfway, two feet of soil, it'd be one inch of water, right? Two inches total, one inch of water depleted. And knowing our evaporation rates here in Florida, we know that on a fully vegetated uh, field, you should be just under, uh, you know, 0.3, they say just under. Uh, mostly that's been done in citrus with a little bit of grass middles. I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna call it a third of an inch per day um, on a hot, dry, windy day. And so we know one inch of water, one acre inch per, uh, per irrigation every three days is about the most water we could need. And if that's the most water we can need, and we're not gonna draw it from the deep aquifer, which is our, our goal here is not to use aquifarian water to, to irrigate. And what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna build a pond. So it's very easy to figure out how much pond you need. All you need to do is figure out how many inches of drop you're gonna have in your pond uh, based on the number of acres you're gonna irrigate at what interval. So we know every acre gets one inch of water every three days max. If you're doing 30 acres under irrigation, right, and you have a one acre pond, you're gonna cause a 30 inch drop. In a two acre pond, you'll cause a 15 inch drop. And then you figure what's your refill rate based on how quickly that pond will refill from the groundwater table. And uh, once you've got that figured out, you can, you can go ahead and size your pond and dig it, except you can't just dig it. You've gotta get permission from the Water Management District and from the Army Corps of Engineers and you've got to do uh, all of your uh, survey work. And uh, that's the process we're involved in now. And so very shortly, we're hoping that we get our signed permissions from the appropriate authorities and we can go ahead and start to dig and then we'll have water and we can put this lovely uh, Sinninger Wobbler irrigation in. And when that becomes critical is when our winter cover crop is gonna go in because that's our dry season. We're coming right now into our wet season. So April, April, the rains should, you know, if everything's with us, the rain should start end of April, May, they start to really pick up and then we should have plenty of water as long as we don't have some sort of unexpected horrible drought, which I don't expect because it'd be unexpected. And uh, we'll be able to be growing a summer cover crop to start to start to put some biomass on the ground here in these fields and that'll get us ready to uh, to put in our irrigation after the pond is dug to cover us during the dry season and trees should go in the following spring if not the middle of winter <laughs>